on Life and Meaning is brought to you by Blumenthal Performing Arts, celebrating its 25th year presenting the best in the performing arts, sharing and employing the arts as a major catalyst to strengthen education, building community cohesiveness, and advancing economic growth. Further support is provided by Charlotte Mecklenburg Library, one of America's leading urban public libraries, delivering exceptional services and programs with a mission to improve lives and build a stronger community and by the Arts and Science Council, Charlotte Mecklenburg's resource hub and lead advocate for the regional cultural community, providing culture for all. I want to break down barriers. I want to connect. I want to be close enough to see the dancer sweat. I want to see the spit come out of the actor's mouth. I want to see the potter see, have a pot fall apart in front of his wheel. I want to be a part of all of that. So when you ask me what do I love, I love it all. And I want to, to consume it all. And there are not enough hours in the day. Robert Bush is president of the Arts and Science Council, Charlotte Mecklenburg's lead resource hub and cultural advocate. Robert serves as the chief strategic and executive officer of the organization and lead representative of the ASC to the broader community. Prior to joining the ASC, Robert served as president of the United Arts Council of Raleigh and Wake County and president of Arts United of Greater Fort Wayne. He is a recipient of the Selena Roberts Odom Award for Arts Leadership from the Americans for the Arts, the Legacy Award from the Harvey B. Gantt Center for African American Arts and Culture, and the Governor's Award for Meritorious Service to the Citizens of North Carolina. In this episode, we explore developing culture in community and the power of art to change lives. I'm Mark Paris, and this is On Life and Meaning. Welcome, Robert. Thank you, Mark. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, too. What is the Arts and Science Council? The Arts and Science Council is an agency that's been around since the 1950s. Uh, we're actually getting ready to celebrate our 60th anniversary uh, in the fall of this year. But we are also what is best described in many other of our peer cities as the Department of Cultural Affairs or the Mayor's Office of Cultural Affairs for local government. Um, we are unique in that we are a public-private partnership. Uh, so we have private dollars that we raise and endowments that we have raised that we use the earnings off of. But we also are the agency that the public bodies in the county use to distribute their dollars for arts, science, and history programming across the community. Robert, you did say that the ASC has been about this work of bringing culture to the city for about 60 years. Mm -hmm. Charlotte is often described as corporate, that its culture is vanilla, middle of the road, nothing special, relatively safe. What do you say? I say that that is Charlotte being hard on itself. We are something that the community may or may not know is that Actually, the economic development strategy of this city since the mid-1970s has been investment in arts and culture. The leadership of government at the time, city and county, the Chamber of Commerce, other business leaders decided that how was Charlotte going to differentiate itself from its competitor cities? And they decided that investing in arts and culture was the path that was the best path for this city to take. One of the sayings that comes out of that 75 plan is, we don't have a mountain or mountains, we don't have a beach, we don't have a river that runs through the middle of town, we didn't have professional sports at the time, but what did we have and the opportunity that we had was to build cultural infrastructure. So in, that, in the 1970s, mid-70s, the leaders of this community envisioned not just growing the Mint and the Children's Theater and the Symphony and the Opera that we already had. They also said, you know, we need to take this little 
nature museum in Freedom Park and turn it into a real science museum, and the result is Discovery Place. We need to build a program that respects the cultural life of our African-American citizens, and the Afro-American Cultural Center, now the Gantt Center, was born. They even envisioned in that plan in 75 uh, that Charlotte needed to be thinking about the R&D of the arts, the sort of creative process. And they said, wouldn't it be interesting if there was an artist colony in the center city? Now we have the McCall Center for Art and Innovation. They also, at the time, realized that Ovens Auditorium, which was the Performing Arts Center at the time, that's where you went for the symphony or the opera. There was no Broadway tour at the time. And they said, we need to build a real Performing Arts Center. And... Also, they said we need to take the abandoned, then abandoned First Baptist Church on North Tryon Street and turn it into a cultural center, which is now Spirit Square. We have, over this past 40 years, built a lot of infrastructure and even new facilities in the last decade, all of which are home to major institutions and emerging institutions. What we have not been good about that we are working at very hard now is to ensure that every community in Mecklenburg County has access to quality arts, science, and history programming close to where they live, that we are encouraging new and emerging thinking in the arts, sciences, and history to flourish, which is something that was We've always had project grants, but we have a very specific effort now focused on that sort of emerging work in the creative sector. We also do training for groups and individuals, but we have a a program for training volunteers called CLT, Cultural Leadership Training, and in the very first class of that program 13 years ago, in the very first session of the class, we were doing an overview of the sector and ASC and a young man in the class, after we fin- I had finished this long PowerPoint presentation, <laughs> raised his hand and he said, this is great. This is amazing. I didn't know all this stuff. He said, but I have a question. He said, what are you doing for the things that my infant son is going to love when he's an adult that we can't even describe yet? And that question has haunted me to this day. So every day I get up thinking about what are we doing for those art forms, those scientific inventors and the hist- to capture the history of this community that we haven't been doing to ensure that we are not vanilla because we're not. We are very fortunate to live in a community that has incredible musical talent, that has incredible visual artists that has, is seeing with this growth in the millennial population here, new activist artists who are pushing the envelope in many ways. And so the thing that I think that we've, we, we are still trying to get over, but what I think we're finally over the hill with is I think the community realizes now that one of something in the arts, science, or history is not enough because that one voice can't tell all the stories. We have to make sure that there are multiple voices telling multiple stories, and that brings us the richness and flavor and color of what I feel is an amazing cultural community and what outside of Charlotte people feel is we have resources and activities here that they would only hope to have in their city. Robert, I do want to talk about the talent pool. Mm -hmm. The ASC works with the citizens it has. Mm -hmm. Clearly, you admire the artists that we have in town, but we are a city of a million people. Is there a sufficient pool of artists in Charlotte producing great art for the ASC to support to actually shift the culture of the city? Well, first, um, I think that... Every one of the million people that live in this county are an artist. They may not see themselves as an artist, but they are an artist. And that we need to respect both the professional artist and the avocational artist. And that 
I'm, I want great singers who sing opera, but I want great singers who sing in the church choir. And they are equal in my eye. They are not different. So based on that, I believe there is an incredible amount of talent in this community that is extraordinary. We don't have the resources to fund all the great ideas that are presented to us. So on that sort of check alone, there's more out, there's more going on out there than what we are supporting. But that's also the sort of natural way that things happen. If you go to New York or if you went to Atlanta or if you went to D.C., there are more people that are work creating and working outside the funding system than are inside the funding system. That doesn't mean that we aren't constantly striving to engage new people in the things that we have that we can support. And so I think the challenge is more making sure people know what is available here for them that can support them. They may not all need money. They may need different things. They may need a class that we're offering on how to be a good business person as well as an artist so you do make money to make a living. It could be that they need access to space. So one of the things we do is we help underwrite the Black Box Theater, the Duke Energy Theater at Spirit Square, so that it is available at a very low or no cost to theater artists in the community. And that's why we now have 30-plus producing theater groups in this community, because they have a space that they can utilize for trying out their work. A cultural community, a creative community, is really about two sort of ends of the spectrum. One of the spe- end of the spectrum are the big cultural iconic events we all want to be a part of, whether that is a big exhibition like the, the Enfoque exhibitions of Mexican photography, contemporary Mexican photography at the Mint and the Beckler and all over the community this past year, or that Hamilton's coming in the fall, or that the symphony and the ballet are doing a new Rite of Spring and later this year. I mean, there are all these iconic things. There are dinosaurs coming to the Discovery Place this summer. I mean, all those things that we want to be a part of. But it's also these very small, intimate experiences that it's about being in a room with people we may know or may not know, and experiencing something together in a gallery or a theater or taking a class with someone and dancing with them or singing with them or learning to drum with them. It is this wide range of experience. I firmly believe that it's that work on the entire scale that is at the heart of the why I do what I do. My job is about building this community, and I firmly believe that art, science, and history activity and programming is the best way to build community, to bridge difference, to make us one community with one voice. Robert, I do want to push back a little bit on the talent pool. Uh, Amazon recently bypassed the city of Charlotte as it looked for a new headquarters because Charlotte lacks a sufficient pool of technical talent. And the notion is that there isn't a lot of innovation here, technological innovation, entrepreneurial innovation, cultural innovation, that were kind of stuck in a time warp in the 1990s. What is your response? Well, I mean, I think that there's a lot of innovation here. I think that we have not told the story of the innovation that takes place here, perhaps quite like it should be told. For example, ATMs were invented in Charlotte by IBM and the banking community here. Something as simple as the orange barrels that we see in road construction were invented here in Charlotte. Even the uh, first air conditioning was invented here in Charlotte because of the hosiery mills and the cotton manufacturing industry. So there are many, many things that were invented right here in Charlotte that never are talked about. Part of that is our southernness, that we don't brag, which we do. We just don't necessarily brag about things that matter. (laughs) But 
there is innovation taking place here every day. I mean, I saw in the so I was reading something in the paper this morning about the Amazon bid, and someone said, do people not understand that the second largest Microsoft installation in the entire world outside of Redmond is in Charlotte? We don't talk about that very much. We don't talk about the financial technical industries that are blossoming here. We don't talk about what's happening with Duke Energy and technology that is quite extraordinary. So we sort of have talked about ourselves in one way, and I think that that sort of con makes people convinced that that's who we are when it doesn't give the full breadth. There is innovation here. It just doesn't seem to get talked about. And I think that's the challenge we need to make sure we're overcoming is we need to tell that story first and more. I was actually part of the team that put together the Amazon package. And I learned a lot about how there are more technical people moving here than almost anywhere in the country. There are more, we are the most desired location for millennials. I mean, there are all these things that are the pluses. I'm not going to get into analyzing why 20 cities were picked and other cities were not, but I don't think that this is a slap in the face. It is a, we need to tell the story better. You were on the team mm -hmm. that put the bid together. Upon reflection, what would you have done differently? Well, I was on, I was a part of the team for the quality of life side of the story. And I think we did a really good job. I was not privy to the whole package, so I can't speak to everything that's in there. I can only sort of respond to as I hear things. I think that our package was creative and different and unlike anything that Charlotte has produced before in pitching to a company. And we were very attuned to making sure that we were listening to what they were asking for and that we were making sure that we were telling a broad story of the incredible diversity and talent that is in this community. We just didn't hit the mark for whatever reason. We can speculate on lots of things. Is the team that put it together debriefing? We have not had a meeting yet, uh, but I'm sure that we will probably pull together. Robert, in 2014, the ASC issued a report, mm -hmm. a vision for Charlotte Mecklenburg's 21st century cultural development. It's subtitled Imagine 2025. Mm -hmm. In broad terms, what is the vision ASC has for Charlotte for 2025? It is a vision of a community where cultural activity and participation is not defined by just the fabulous facilities that line Tryon Street. It is one that embraces that and the individual creative activities that people do across this city every day. It is Yard Art Day and a sculpture exhibition as well. It is the church choir singing and the oratorio singers of the Charlotte Symphony singing Elijah as well. It is community theater and Hamilton. It is the ballet and hip hop dance. It is this full embracing of cultural expression across the million people that live here. It's also grounded in three very important themes. First, the cultural community should be about building community. And that's because the community has told us that this is, we provide the safe space to bridge difference. The plays, the exhibitions, the concerts, the classes that we offer through the cultural sector are the place to learn who my neighbor is and what they bring to the table. Safe space. Second, it is about innovative and relevant programming for a rapidly changing population. As someone said, 
we have built these beautiful buildings, but they are no good unless the work that is being created around them and in them is relevant and innovative for a 21st century Charlotte that we're just beginning to glimpse. So that is the respect for multiple cultures, the respect for pushing the envelope, the respect for trying things in new and different ways. And then finally, the citizens of this community want their children to have access to these amazing cultural institutions that we have created over 40 plus years, to be engaged in the exhibitions and performances that take place in them, and to learn and to see themselves in new ways that they may never have seen themselves before, because this community believes that art, science, and history is central to the education of our children. We are seven years away from 2025. What are we winning at? Well, we are seeing some really interesting things happen. One of the things that we're trying to do, because the, the report and the report that followed up said, ASC, reinvent thyself. So we have been uh, going about that as a part of this change. They used to talk in Charlotte about, oh, we have this great arts council. I don't want them to, I mean, I'm happy to be called a great arts council, but I want the city to be known for they have the most amazing craft collection at the Mint. They have the best modern art collection at the Beckler. Have you been to the Gant and seen what they're doing? Have you heard the symphony? Have you seen the plays that are coming to the Blumenthal? The Children's Theater is the best children's theater in the country. I mean, I want that kind of knowledge out there. That's what's going to make us differentiate ourselves, not having a great arts council. I'm a paper pusher primarily. I get to do very little art. I grab at snippets when I can be engaged in a conversation at work about art. So that reinvention is part of this. And so we've done things like we used to just say we'll take any idea for a project. We don't do that anymore. We've changed that program to say, if you're interested in funding for a project from us, it has to be aligned to one of two things. It has to be about building community, or it has to be about innovative and relevant programming for a changing population. Well, we're starting to hear from organizations and artists that we've never heard from in this community before because they're stepping up because all of a sudden the frame is there for them to actually do something that is what the community is saying they want to take place. Robert, I'd like to shift gears. I'm wondering if you could speak to the Arts and Science Council response to the Keith Lamont Scott shooting in Charlotte. Um, I had an interesting perspective of that whole several days. So the Monday and Tuesday of that week, I was actually in with a number of my peers from nonprofits as well as corporate and other leaders in the community in a two-day workshop sponsored by Race Matters for Juvenile Justice called Dismantling Racism that is a very intense and revealing history lesson that's presented over two days of how the system has been built for privilege since the 1600s in this country. And about the time we got out of um, the class that second day was when the shooting took place. I was flying out on Wednesday morning to go to Sundance for four days <laughs> to do a in-depth experience with other leaders of cities, art agencies like ASC. And so I watched the aftermath of the shooting via television. And it was it was a profound experience. Um, 
And then in that period, we were asked if we would sign this letter with other community leaders, and we immediately said we would. But that was not where this journey around access and equity inclusion began. This has been a part of the DNA of this institution for a very long time. Even before my time here at ASC, but in the past 16, 17 years, it has become even more profound. Many of the staff and board leadership of ASC have invested a lot of time even before or after they were here in participating in training through the Community Building Initiative around issues of leadership in this area. ASC was an active and, I think, leader in the, the whole Crossroads Charlotte effort. The community very clearly spoke to us in the cultural vision plan effort of their seeing the role that the cultural community must play in dealing with these issues. We have embraced that. A board chair of mine back 12, 15 years ago, he and I were at a session that was actually the, one of the first Crossroads Charlotte sessions. And the whole sort of premise of the looking to the future and how do we make this a place that's a good place for everyone was presented. And this board chair, who was a very hot person at one of the banks, um, turned to me and said, if this isn't the work of ASC, then we're in the wrong business. And so that sort of philosophy of we have to be about the entire community, not one slice of the community, has been a driving force around here for a long time. That is not liked by everyone. That is their opinion. And there are many reasons why it is our, our business. We are funded by citizens through their tax dollars, and that means everybody has access, not a few. We see kids get off the bus who live within eyesight of the skyline of the center city, and they, the bus pulls up in front of the Performing Arts Center or the Mint or the Discovery Place, and these children step off the bus, and their first reaction is, I'm not allowed to go in there. And we have to remind them that these institutions belong to them just like they belong to me or you or anyone else that lives in a slice of this community. We have done things before and after to address these issues. This work is very important to us, but that is because it's the right thing to do, that if we want a vibrant cultural community that speaks to the many voices that are here now and that are still coming and arriving here, we have to ensure that everyone has access. And that's why access is the first thing in the mission of ASC now. The work of access and equity and inclusion is personal to you, too. There's emotion in your voice. Why? Um, I think I said before that I think that participation in the arts, whether as a consumer or as an active participant, can be a profound thing in changing people's lives. And I have actually witnessed over my career people whose lives were changed because the arts were made available to them or a science project or they learned their history in a better and stronger way. And I have seen that not in communities that I've lived in. I have seen it in places that I was merely visiting as a grant panelist or I was visiting as a consultant for a project 
where it is a profound thing to see how powerful art can be in changing lives. And so that's why it's personal to me. I know it did it for me. When I first came to Charlotte to work for the Mint Museum uh, back in the 80s and was so excited to finally live in a big city and I lived in Dilworth and I worked in Myers Park. I mean, it was kind of, you know, it was like all of the, you had it all sort of wrapped into one. But I realized after about a year that I was just going back and forth from home to work and home to work and I really wasn't engaged in the community. And so I sort of went back to experiences I'd had in other places that I'd lived and I had done community theater and I decided, okay, you just got to sort of pull up your boots and get back out there again. And I auditioned at Theater Charlotte and was cast in a production of Best Little Whorehouse in Texas and friends that I made from that experience and subsequent plays that I was in at Theater Charlotte are friendships that are dear to me to this day. So the arts were my connection to becoming a Charlottean. Robert, you grew up in Hickory, North Carolina. You've said in public remarks that you lived the perfect childhood. How was it the perfect childhood? Well, I mean, it was the classic sort of American small town story, also very Southern. My parents' home was close enough to the downtown that I could be turned loose and sent off to go and explore in any direction I want, whether it was one direction to the swimming pool and the creek and the the little zoo that we have, or it was the other direction up the hill to be in the some commercial center of the city. This is before malls were out there, actually. So there's there was one commercial sort of center. My parents made sure we had every opportunity. I have friends to this day that were my friends in childhood from kindergarten through high school and college and to today. I had great teachers. I had great support. I had family that loved me and cared for me. It was idyllic. Robert, you went to Appalachian State University and studied Spanish and education. Correct. What were your ambitions? I had intended to be a Spanish teacher first, and then I was going to eventually be a principal and then a superintendent of schools. And I did start that path, and but then ended up in a school for kids that were, cons- we would call them at risk now. But these were kids that primarily by the court system had been sort of given a choice. You can go to this school and sort of try and get back on the path, or you can go to jail. And the school was sort of given a lot of freedom to do whatever we needed to do to get these kids excited about learning. And we decided that we would use an arts-based curriculum. So everything we taught in the school, math, science, history, English, everything had an art component to it. The math teacher was a weaver, so she was teaching kids on these big looms how to weave, but the math of putting together the warp and the th- all the threading and how this had to go together to make this piece of fabric. The science teacher was a potter, and so she was teaching them to throw pots on the wheel, but how do you put a glaze, and how does a glaze react in a kiln when you're firing this thing? So this is art-based curriculum. And we also had an Outward Bound school, and... I actually taught the whitewater backpacking and all that kind of stuff that was with the Outward Bound School in addition to the English. And so after about six years, one morning I woke up and it was like, the only people you know are kids that have problems you can't solve. I needed to do something different. And so uh, there was my concentration for my education master's degree was in community education. And, of course, that is sort of looking at an entire community as a classroom, not as just a school as a classroom, but museums and parks and libraries and theaters are all part of this extended classroom that we have built as a community. And so 
there was an ad for they were hiring the first arts council director. And I was young enough and cocky enough, and I was like, I can do that. And I applied and I got the job. And I was very successful at it. So I don't think that I left education. I think that I just changed classrooms. So for six, eight years, I was in a classroom and teaching Spanish within four walls. But for the last 35 years, I have been in a classroom that is as wide open as it can be and includes every resource that you can probably imagine. And that I'm still teaching. I'm just teaching people how to connect with this cultural infrastructure that they have built. Robert, you found your way to the Mint Museum. Mm -hmm. What did you do there? I was the first director of development. So I was, the, at the time, the Mint was a department of the city of Charlotte. And all the employees, except for me, were uh, employees of the city. And it was not just art. It was art and history. And they, in the early 80s, mid-80s, decided that there was an expansion of the museum to build the Dalton Wing for the Randolph Road site. And they decided that they needed to start raising money on their own uh, through memberships and other sort of things. And so they brought me in to lead the development effort for the first time at the Mint. Then he became president of Arts United in Fort Wayne. Correct. And then the United Arts Council of Raleigh and Wake County. Correct. What were those years like? They were very much like being here in Charlotte, actually. Both the Fort Wayne, which is sort of the equivalent of the ASC in Fort Wayne, Indiana. In Raleigh, it was a little different because it was a new agency that Raleigh is the only city in the state of North Carolina that has a city department of cultural affairs. And there was a desire to have a companion not public-private partnership out in the community. And so I was brought in to create that agency. I enjoyed my time in Raleigh, but Charlotte was always my city. In 2000, you joined ASC as senior vice president. Mm -hmm. Why would you go from being president of an arts organization to becoming the senior vice president of another arts organization? So there was a little interim there for about in 1997, I left the Arts Council in Raleigh and because I decided that I'd had enough of boards of directors and I, had, I was being asked to do consulting all over. And I, so I decided that I, would just, I was going to go out there and work for the clients that wanted my, me to help them and I would do all kinds of things. So I started my own consulting firm and worked across the United States, a lot of work in the Bay Area of California and in other Western states, as well as in North Carolina, South Carolina. My biggest client was Fulton County, Georgia. Uh, and I did a number of things for them. I did facility assessment and planning. I redesigned their entire support system for arts in the schools through the Fulton County Arts Council. I was placed with the, in a consulting role with the National Black Arts Festival to help them overcome some very difficult situations that they were in that could have ended the festival, which would have been a tragedy. So I was doing all this work. And so it had my own firm, and I loved it. And I was sort of, you know, my own boss, and it was working great, and I was doing fine. And then my the head of the Fulton County Arts Council was hired to be the president of ASC. Is that Harriet Sanford? Harriet Sanford. And within about a week, Harriet called, and she knew that I had Charlotte connections. And she called and said, I need to hire you for every day you've got between now and the end of June. I need somebody who can help me navigate Charlotte. Within about a month, and I said, sure. I mean, when you're a consultant, you take the jobs that are placed before you. So after about a month, it was, well, you know, we've got this planning job. Maybe you ought to just come here and be the planner for us. And, of course, Charlotte has this, and the ASC in particular, has this great reputation nationally for being the experts in cultural planning in the country for cities. And so this was a chance for me to really kind of take that that piece on and take it to its fullest extent and we did i mean we did suburban plans for each of the six suburban communities in mecklenburg county we did 
planning around support for individual artists. We, I was the lead staff person on the cultural facilities master plan that resulted in the Levine Center and the redo of the Discovery Place. Then eventually led the new cultural vision plan for Charlotte, Mecklenburg, and the supporting documents that talk about the change in the funding model. And then in, the, in between all of that, I've also played multiple roles here at ASC in leading all of the funding effort and overseeing public art and education and funding. So I've had lots of multiple roles and then was fortunate in 2013 when my predecessor left for to be named interim and then in the spring of 2014 named the president of ASC. Robert, you have served under three presidents, mm -hmm. Harriet Sanford, Lee Kiesler, and Scott Provencher. What did you learn from them? Hmm. Um, I think they each brought different things to the community at a different at different times that were needed, and in many ways we complemented each other. Harriet's understand deeps understanding and love for the role of the arts in shaping community is clearly something that I continue to carry to this day, and I give her a lot of the things that she started are the things that we're finally seeing realized now. This work deep in community, the power of art, science, and history to change community, those were the things that Harriet came to, to do here, and it's that work is still being done. Lee is a dear friend as well. I mean, they're all three very dear friends. Um, but Lee brought me this sense of the native Charlottean that I had known but had sort of put away for some reason, and he brought that back, as well as his willingness to always learn and to step back and to, uh, to think about things and then devise a path forward, and I really appreciated being around him for that. Scott brought other skills to the table, and Scott and I had a lot of fun together with playing with the model here and trying to rethink in a very difficult time. Scott came right as the recession's full force hit this city. And so innovation became the drive. How can we do this differently? How can we think about this differently? Don't be afraid to throw out a big idea. We, we threw out some big ideas that stuck and have continued to work. We threw out some that we about got run out of the room on the rail, but it was okay. I mean, it's sort of working with Scott was this sort of freedom to take a risk, to think about a risk, to not be sort of boxed in. And that has really served ASC and me well in the last five years that we really are having to not be afraid to take a chance and sometimes we win and sometimes we don't but that doesn't mean we don't pick learn from what we made a mistake on and pick ourselves up and move forward and i also had a i also have a very long and deep relationship with michael morsicano who preceded harriet so i have this deep knowledge across decades of the work that's been done in this agency there were two changes of presidency while you were the number two did you ever feel passed over Well, the first time, I was the interim, and I didn't apply. The second time, I think I could have felt passed over, but they, the search committee came to me and said, we have hired this person for you. We have hired this person because we think that the two of you together are the, t the team to do this work that needs to be done. And so I was willing to accept that, and it worked out. If I had been passed over the third time, I'd have probably said goodbye. <laughs> what is different about being president versus being a senior vice president? Um, not much. <laughs> I will say that in the role that I'm in now, 
I find myself more guarded than I have ever felt before. I know that, and I knew this before, that if I came into a room, even when I was, all the roles that I played at DC, but even more so now, if I step into the room that immediately it's either seen that ASC is endorsing this or ASC is going to fund this or ASC is, it is, I can't just be present and listen. So I have to be very careful about that. I also have to be very cautious about what I say. And I have to be very clear in dis- making the distinction between what ASC thinks and what I personally think because they are not necessarily the same things all the time. And that doesn't mean that I don't have a great influence on what the ASC thinks. But when I'm in that role, I'm thinking about what's best for the entire community. I'm a little more guarded of my time. I am, people don't know this necessarily. I'm actually an introvert, even though I'm very public a lot. I can turn it on and off, but there comes a point most every day that I really need a cocoon. (laughs) I need to sort of not be out there. And so I relish I now relish my time, my private time, and my time with those that are the closest to me personally more than I ever did before. I mean, I have to have that, which is a very different sort of thing. And it's not that I'm trying to keep anything from people, but it's trying to protect me and that there's going to be a me after ASC and I need to make sure the me after ASC is ready for the next path. There will also be an ASC after you. Correct. How do you think the ASC is different because of your leadership? I hope that there is this sense of joy. We have spent a lot of time trying to make sure this is a joyful place. I mean, we are about a joyful thing, and so we need to be joyful in the work that we do. I hope that there is a sense of respect for those that are here that are highly skilled at the work that they do and letting them do the work that they do. I think that we have cemented deeply even more than it was here before, and that's maybe my greatest accomplishment this commitment to the entire community and not a few. I hope that there is a understanding and continuing importance of the role of listening to community. One of the things that I've tried to do is to institutionalize some of those processes so that we're in a constant feedback loop of listening to community. And I think that that is the new way of planning for a cultural world is we're done with these every 10 year plans. We need to constantly be listening, learning, adapting, changing, taking a risk, trying something new. We have to be the model of how you are continually respecting what has come before, but reinventing yourself for the community that you live in now. You've said that people just want to see and experience the things that they love. What is it that you love? I love theater. And I think that's because I love stories and I love, I'm love to read. So I think that those are clearly aligned. I actually think that that's one of the things that I'm, we're, we're trying to do better around the literary arts than we perhaps have done in the past. And I think that that's a, it's a really important thing is that a lot of times people forget that the literary arts are this sort of fundamental for all the arts. It's not just the performing arts, but the visual arts too are grounded in these literary histories that we carry with us. I love contemporary art and I especially love contemporary craft. 
it's not that I don't like old masters, but I am drawn. I mean, I'm a kid of the 50s, so I'm drawn to contemporary art. And it is emotional to me to be around great contemporary art. I love jazz more than I thought I did. That's been a new sort of love that I have, have has happened in the last decade. I have learned to love contemporary dance. Ballet was never something. I mean, I have, I have seen the Nutcracker a thousand times, but the ballet company here has taken me to places that I only thought Alvin Ailey could take me, and I still love Alan Ailey, Ailey, but I also want to see this company sort of in its full-grown rebirth. So that's something that I love. I, I guess that I, I can be happy in it all. I love the arts. I love museums. I love science museums. I love history museums. I love libraries. And they're just a big museum of books. I mean, I love this content that surrounds me. And so I can find myself in many different ways. That doesn't mean that I like everything. And some of the things that I don't like, I think it's not because of the art. It's because of the way it's presented. It's like... I want to break down barriers. I want to connect. I want to be close enough to see the dancer sweat. I want to see the spit come out of the actor's mouth. I want to see the potter have a pot fall apart in front of his wheel. I want to be a part of all of that. So when you ask me what do I love, I love it all, and I want to, to consume it all, and there are not enough hours in the day. And that's why I'm looking forward to the next phase which I don't know when it's going to happen, but it's it'll happen. Right now, I'm happiest at cultural events when I slip in at the last minute and take my seat in the back in the dark or go to a museum in the middle of the day when there are very few people there and wander around. Because if I'm there now, ASC's in the room. Art is a personal journey for me. It is not just my job. It is who I am, and those connections are very important to me, and I want that back. (laughs) Thank you for your time today, Robert. Thank you. Robert Bush is president of the Arts and Science Council, Charlotte Mecklenburg's lead resource hub and cultural advocate. He holds a bachelor's and master's degree in education administration and supervision with a concentration in community education from Appalachian State University. And now, a personal word. Robert Bush's passion for the arts is real and exciting. His love for the arts overflows as he reveals what art means to him. You can hear the jazz fusion in the air and see the contemporary paintings on the wall as he describes the art that he loves. Robert is moved by what he does and the citizens he serves. He is leading the Arts and Science Council with a joy that inspires. But there is something about administering the arts that is very strange. Arts administration is an internal contradiction. It is business management that seeks to support and encourage artistic expression. It fulfills a bureaucratic function, writing plans, issuing budgets, transferring monies, charting metrics, and advocating policy about the arts, about human creativity, about the very activity that seeks to drive a spike into management. Art is resistance. Art is rebellion. Art is, as Walt Whitman and Robin Williams cried out, a barbaric yop. Art seeks to express truth and beauty and justice. It is an unbinding. It is spray paint. It is monumental design. It is melody and harmony and rhythm. It is anger. It is sorrow and gratitude and love. 
Yet art councils create a world in which artists and innovators must fill out applications for grants, keep spreadsheets, send invoices, align with community needs, and report outcomes. It is a weird thing, arts administration. All of it kills and sustains culture for all. Which begs the question, what is culture anyway? In 2014, Joshua Rothman wrote a piece for The New Yorker entitled The Meaning of Culture. In it, he notes how confusing the word culture can be, that it has many definitions, and that it is more than the sum of its definitions. Rothman references the critic Raymond Williams, who writes that culture has three very different meanings. There is culture as individual enrichment, as when we say someone is cultured. There is culture as a community's particular way of life, as when we describe the city's culture as corporate or daring or gritty. And then there is culture as an activity, as measured by the museums, concerts, festivals, and public art, encouraged by a ministry of culture, like the Arts and Science Council. Rothman notes that each time we use the word culture, we incline toward one or another of these meanings toward the culture that makes you a more insightful and expressive person, toward the culture that includes you in a group, toward a culture that invites you into a venue for a display or a performance. Culture gets even more complicated. The use of the word culture in culture is constantly evolving. Culture once meant the progress of civilization, and later culture was the opposite of the rational rules and efficiencies of civilization. Once it meant the bottom-up expression of a people. Later it meant the top-down agendas of institutions. What does it mean to have a culture of transparency or a culture of accountability? What is high culture or low culture? What does multiculturalism mean? Rothman ends his reflection on culture with what culture, however defined, and all ministries of culture are ultimately about a good life, a life in which we express and appreciate human creativity in full. Rothman writes that culture represents a wish, a wish that, quote, a group of people might discover together a good way of life, that their good way of life might express itself in their habits, institutions, and activities, and that those, in turn, might help individuals flourish in their own way, end quote. This is the work that Robert Bush is engaged in, creating the conditions in which each of us, all of us, can flourish. This is Mark Paris, and you've been listening to On Life and Meaning. Thank you to my partners, Andy Go, producer of the show, and to Chris Curriton, art and media director. This is how you can help. Please write a review on iTunes. It helps us grow our audience. Follow us on Facebook. We'd love to hear what you think about the show. And become a patron. We are on Patreon, a crowdsourcing platform that allows you to support what you value. Visit us also on our website on lifeandmeaning.com. Thank you for listening.